Bonjour à tous et toutes. Euh, je m'appelle Sylvie Rosenthal, je suis la directrice générale de l'Orchestre de la francophonie. Ben, bienvenue à la saison 2021 de l'OF. Euh, C'est notre 20e saison. Et bienvenue à la série Invité de marque. Euh, notre invité aujourd'hui est Jeff Nelson et nous sommes ravis que M. Nelson soit avec nous aujourd'hui. Alors, merci à vous, Jeff, d'être avec nous. Euh, juste pour euh, vous parler un peu de Jeff Nelson, Jeff est un corniste canadien. Il enseigne le corps à la Jacobs School of Music de l'Université de l'Indiana à Bloomington. Il a passé huit années en tournée et a enregistré avec le Canadian Brass. Euh, Jeff a aussi interprété des concertos et joué de la musique de chambre sur les six continents. Et dans la section des corps de dizaines d'orchestres, il est aussi un mentor spécialisé. Aujourd'hui, le, le titre de sa présentation est La performance technique sans avoir peur. So, welcome everyone. My name is Sylvie Rosenthal. I'm the executive um, director of L'Orchestre de la Francophonie. Welcome to the 2021st season of the L'Orchestre de la Francophonie. It's our 20th season and welcome to the series special guest presentations. Our guest today is Jeff Nelson and we are really delighted to uh, have him with us today. Thanks to you, Jeff. And a little bit about Jeff. Uh, Jeff Nelson is a Canadian horn player and is a, a professor at, of horn at the Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. He spent eight years touring and recording with the Canadian Brass, and Jeff has also performed concerty and chamber music on six continents and in the horn sections of a dozen of orchestras. He's also a life coach. And today, uh, his presentation is Fearless Performance. So before we start, um, I would like to uh, acknowledge all our partners. So, um, avant de débuter la présentation, je voudrais remercier uh, nos partenaires et, rec et l'OF reconnaît l'appui du gouvernement du Canada et d'Emploi Québec Île de Montréal. L'OF remercie aussi ses commanditaires, Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie les fondations suivantes RBC Foundation, Fondation Sibilia S le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et la Zeller Family Foundation. So, just want to acknowledge all our partners. Uh, L'OF acknowledges the Government of Canada support and Emploi Québec, Ile de Montréal. The OF would like to thank their private sponsors, Canimex and Panorama Media. The OF would like to thank also the following foundations for their great support. RBC Foundation, Fondation CBAS, Le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada, and the Zeller Family Foundation. So, it's great to have you all here. C'est vraiment chouette que vous soyez avec nous. La programmation complète est disponible aussi à la page d'accueil du, du site de l'Orchestre de la Francophonie. Et vous pouvez aussi nous suivre à la page Facebook de l'Orchestre à facebook.com barre oblique orchestre franco. Si vous cliquez sur l'onglet plus et événements, vous allez avoir toute la liste des activités. Uh, you can follow us also on uh, the website of l'OF. You can have access to all the program of this, uh, this season. Or you can follow us also on Facebook at facebook.com slash orchestre franco. And you tab on the plus and the événements and you will have all the list of the program if you want. Um, also, you can follow us on Instagram, on the YouTube channel avec la chaîne YouTube de l'OF. Et also, uh, vous pouvez nous suivre uh, à Twitter, uh, hashtag OF-2021. So on Twitter, it's hashtag OF-2021. So uh, just to finish, um, tous les élèves pourront poser des questions durant la présentation. All the students can ask questions uh, during the um, presentation. Et le public aussi peut poser des questions. Donc, euh, dans le Zoom, vous allez à Q&A et vous, avez, vous pouvez écrire vos questions et on va pouvoir euh, y avoir accès. 
Uh, donc, um, all, uh, all the students can ask questions during the presentation. And for the public, you can also ask questions. If you go on the Zoom, on a Q&A, you can write your question down and we'll, it will be a pleasure for us. Uh, Jeff will have a pleasure to answer to all your questions. Alors, merci et bonne présentation. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Hello, everyone. Bon matin. Uh, C'est mon plaisir to be here. And uh, je suis désolé, mon français, ça va mieux. Um, um, I, but I will speak mainly in English. Je suis désolé. Uh, I am from Alberta, out west. And uh, I've been performing all over. And uh, But I've also been very scared to perform all over. So this is what I'm here to talk with everyone about, to everyone and with everyone. Um, so please, number one, bring in your questions because I do a five-day seminar on what I call fearless performance uh, so I can talk forever and I'd much rather uh, go to your questions than keep lecturing and blah blah blah, blah -ing about this. So let's get to it. I want to speak to you um, about basically your one experience that is very common. Uh, I'm guessing you've experienced it too. I've asked all around the world and so far I've I've received 100% yes to this. So ready? Have you ever experienced preparing something to a certain level and then going out on stage to perform said thing and have it go not quite as well? I don't know if anyone has ever experienced that. This is how I see that. I show that visually. Um, it's basically what I call the quality gap. The difference between what you can do uh, and then what you do live when you walk out on stage and perform for your first time. Um, there's a quality gap there <laughs> after we've done the preparation. And I think we all agree if you're here that you know that can be one of the most frustrating things. It had me quit horn, had me almost quitting horn a couple other times after that, but I quit for three years in high school came back. Um, I'm going to sprinkle also my own stories of my own experiences with fear and then basically figuring out how to choose something better than fear enough times to perform good enough, <laughs> well enough. Um, so the idea is to be across the enough, not enough line. <laughs> um, there's a line here and it's good enough or not good enough. And then this line is defined by our definition of success, whether it's uh, making grandma relax and be happy in your day or be hired and be the, the last, the person that they end up offering the job to. So it's an enough, not enough line and it's not perfection. That perfection is impossible and comparing it is where our fear comes from, comparing to it. Um, not shooting for it. It's great. Go for it. It can be perfection can be our standard and what we go for. But it's when we compare that our own human <laughs> performance and that level of our reality to perfection that we freak out and feel bad about ourselves and do all these things. So this is the stuff that we can talk about today. And please ask any questions about your own performance experience, your training experiences and how to how to put them together um really quickly i'll sprinkle um i also see there's one very young student named douglas sturdivant here i don't know how he snuck in here but uh we will let, allow him to stay if he behaves hello pace uh pace is my teacher so he taught me almost everything i know um except i grew up on a pig farm so i learned that at home in alberta um but yes, good to see you, Pace. Please send your questions in as well. I know you've basically helped me with all of this for, for so long. Um, so I, I grew up on a farm. I played horn for three or four years, and then I quit for three years. Um, people were telling me I'm not practicing enough, which I wasn't, um, but also that you don't want to be a musician. It's too hard, and uh, there aren't enough jobs out there. Um, so I said, okay. And I, I stopped for a long time. Um, but if you think about it, there's, there's lots of job 
challenges, uh, and there always has been. So wouldn't you rather want to be doing something that you love and you can get as good as possible at it and contribute in that creative way of being a musician? Um, so, and that's kind of one thing that drew me back when I was doing other things. I sold shoes for a while and um, went into University of Alberta in general arts for a year and I just missed music so much I came back to it. And why I talk about that uh, is because when I came back to it, I didn't play very well, uh, but I didn't feel bad about playing badly. And I think that is a, the beginnings of fearless performance, is that my self-worth was not wrapped up in what I did. Uh, so when I played badly, uh, or when I left room to play much better, <laughs> uh, I didn't feel as maybe as bad as others, or I still felt bad, but um, and um, but figured out ways of having that bad feeling <clears throat> uh, get me into the practice room instead of slow me down and have me run away from the work. That's a big concept, I think, and it's about good fear, basically. Um, when you when you doubt why you're doing what you're doing and when you stop doing it and you have to do things that are even less enjoyable, that's a reality. At some point, we're all maybe we're all going to have to get jobs at some point. I was a, I went to McGill and I was a, a bartender and a waiter and a bouncer and a DJ in my last years at school. And if, uh, and then I got a job. So I got to make music instead of working at Starbucks and doing these other jobs that are also important to society, but we get maybe a little bit less creativity from you out in the world. So this is the race is to figure out how to perform your best uh, on your first version so that you can end up being hired and invited to perform for people and to record with people or create video projects with this year of quarantine. There's been a lot more video projects made and a lot more musical opportunities online, right, to share, share your creativity. So it's a, in many ways, a explosion of musical opportunities. The bar has been lowered and we're together online without having to travel and this will continue now forever for sure. People are more comfortable online <clears throat> than ever. So there are opportunities in music and it's worth it. I'm also here to tell you it's a dream, a dream life. Um, I tell people that I have uh, an X Xbox and a PlayStation and a couple of big TVs and uh, Tesla and uh, I got all this stuff through making music. It's crazy to think that I earned one dollar by blowing into my horn, you know. But it's it's been quite a ride and it's worth it. The work is worth it. Worth it. I'm going to talk a bit about a system of commitment to your performance opportunities where you ask yourself some questions. And then that's it. Don't keep asking yourself, do I deserve it? Should I go for this or not? And that was one of the big things for me. Um, commit and now get into the work. Now get into practicing. Did I say I was going to talk about it? It sounds like I'm talking about it now. Um, uh, well, yeah, just that, that commitment system of asking yourself, would it be good for me to do this? Um, if I do prepare myself as good as I can, we all know a lot of what we can do to get hireable. Uh, it's more about doing it right and on a daily basis and with healthy inner chatter and all of these uh, factors that we're hearing more and more about. So I'm the big fan of before you start to perform and, and do the training, you ask yourself these questions um, and it's would this audition or performance be good for me if I did it? If I did all the training I needed, is it possible that they end up after offering me the job? And if those get a yes, um, then you keep going. A few more questions. Can I afford to go? Take the trip to the audition. Do I have time um, to do the training that I want to do? I think those are kind of all the big general ones. If those all get a yes, now you're done asking if you deserve it or if you should do the training for this performance. It's all about the music and your technique and your training. And I will be talking about this training in thirds process of preparing for auditions and performances along the way.
which you can that's one of the big chatters is should I be doing this and the waste of discussions with your with our friends and with family and stuff just I was doing a an audition for the Chicago Symphony uh, in 2000 and everyone was saying oh you don't want to do it it's they want someone from Chicago and you know all these and I was just kind of like um, I'm watching the chat a little bit just to keep up with those questions coming in. Um, um, oh, there's, there, I mean, ha, has anyone, sorry, I'm talking about the Chicago audition. I'll finish that story that I, um, everyone was saying, you don't want to do it. They know who they want. They want someone from Chicago. And I just kept going, um, okay, thanks. Um, I got to go. I, I'm going to go practice. I'm going to go be that idiot to go practice and figure things out. Um, and in the finals, there were eight people, and I was the only person not from Chicago. Um, so maybe they were right, or I was the only non-Chicago idiot who went and prepared and did the work to get as good as they could. And then in the fi super finals, it was me and the two people that got the jobs in Chicago. So I was runner-up. I've played with them a dozen times now and got to say no to them a lot because they hire pretty late in, in the process. Um, so if you could, actually, I would love it if you could be uh, typing into the Q&A window uh, what you're scared of, what, or what gets in the way for you as far as your difference between what you can do and what you actually do in performance. Um, so we can kind of, everybody should, for me, I get my mouth goes dry. Um, but oh, what I, what, I, what I am afraid of is not serving the music as well as I could. Uh, and uh, I think showing how much what I love about the music, I think this individual connection to the music is really important for me. And if I'm making mistakes, I'm distracting the audience um, and also lowering my chances for being hired back. <laughs> so we have our first response from Eric Bouchard, uh, who says that he gets shaky. All right, yeah, huh? me too. Um, the so I, I I love tending to the questions as well, and I will try and as you already know now, I jump around, I try and keep it down a what people call a linear line of thought, but uh, I have stories and thoughts around the edges that I like sharing as well, if that can help. Um, yes, live questions would be awesome as well. So I'll get back on topic as often as possible while I field any questions you have along the way, please, anything. Um, I think the I have a structured online course that you can go to and some free courses at uh, www.optcollective uh, uh, is the current one. <laughs> www.optcollective.com and that's where the, the courses are and there's all the very structured workbooks and and um, a lot of useful things there. I'll share some of the workbooks as well today. So shaking. Uh, the question I ask about all these, those are symptoms and those are results of my thinking, uh, I believe. So unless it happens in the practice room or at random times, then that's a bit more of a physical thing or something else is going on, I think, which is uh, also important to look at, of course. But if it happens in performance, then I, um, I'm all about responsibility, and so I take responsibility for that. If it only happens in performance, I'm the person that's changing, right? Because it's still me and my horn and the music and the goals and everything. Um, but mm -hmm, the goals are they the same goals? Maybe not. Maybe when I and this is the thing when I walk out on stage, uh, that's where we can make mistakes. And the biggest one for me is deciding this time matters more. And we shift everything and then we can make some mistakes or start worrying and then the body responds to that worry our breathing gets shallow um, and then we have other really cool uh, science stuff help, helping to keep us safe <laughs> we get small uh, my mouth goes dry is my thing um, so in looking at these things those are the symptoms of mental 
approaches to our performance. And this is where the fundamental work lies, I believe, and have experienced. I'm living proof that you can live your life super, super scared of performance and yet make enough good choices to walk out there and give an enjoyable performance if that's your, your line of success uh, or get hired and hired back. Um, yeah, it's crazy for me to work, grow up on a pig farm uh, with eight people in my town near Edmonton, Alberta, and have played with New York Philharmonic, LA Philharmonic, uh, Toronto and Montreal, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, all of Quebec City, Montreal, uh, Ottawa, National Arts Center, like just all over Chicago, Seattle, uh, Minnesota, orchestra, it's crazy, Cleveland Orchestra, Philadelphia Orchestra, I played principal with Philadelphia Orchestra in Carnegie Hall, some guest principal stuff there, and that's not me, I'm a big farmer, Canadian, farm kid from Edmonton, Alberta, but I stopped asking if I deserve it. Um, and that's when we start shaking. That's when we walk out on stage and ask those questions. Then if we deserve it or not. That is the wrong time to be asking. It's what I talked about before, that commitment part. If I do all the work, is it possible that they hire me or enjoy my concert? Now get to work on the music. Um, the shaking, uh, also for shaking, uh, uh, one of my solutions is to feel gravity. I feel the weight, depending on what instrument you play. Um, my legs can start shaking if I'm sitting out or standing. Um, but it's, I think it's because one of the things is because my attention has gone to my head and lips <laughs> and I forget I have the rest of my body. So one thing I do is oh, I just feel my feet on the floor. Um, and feel or the weight of the atmosphere above me to have me settle down into it. Breathing is a huge, huge help uh, to any symptoms of fearful choices as well. Um, for dry mouth, for me, the biggest thing I do, the first thing I do if I even wonder if my mouth is going dry is I take a huge breath um, because we start sipping air and not wanting to make our mouth more and more dry by uh, taking a big breath but then I play worse because I'm breathing worse so when I wonder if my mouth is dry I take the biggest breath possible and huh, magically curiously I start playing better again and then start getting bigger and out of my safety smallness um, and all all those symptoms or results of thinking this time matters more um, those are, those are signals, signals of, of our choices and what we can learn to perform. Um, I, I say about the, about the fearless performance, fearless performance is actually a result. The, it's much like presence, right? If you know you're present, you're not, because you're also thinking about how you're present. So it's, it's after the performance, you can look back and, and go, hmm, I had... 38.7 uh, moments of fearlessness there, you know, and enough time to reset, get back to playing my best, and then dive back into the music, which is way more important than me in performance, right? Music colleagues sharing, um, keeping the line just smooth and legato and playing in tune with my colleagues, just so nothing distracts our audience from the story. If technical things stick out in performance, it's kind of like um, I asked Dale Clevenger, who was first horn in Chicago for 48 years and now teaches with me at IU. I asked him who his favorite music directors were, and he thought about it, and he named a bunch, 48 years, Chicago Symphony. And uh, But Barenboim was one of his favorites because he said he's, he's not interesting in anything. He's not interested in anything technical. He's interesting, interested with fantasy and storytelling and magic all of these things that was a very bad version of his accent he's from chattanooga that's fine um but if something technical sticks out of the music uh, i picture all the orcs in uh, lord of the rings and they're marching out of middle earth into middle earth i can't remember i have to see that again they're marching out of middle earth and all of a sudden a microphone hits one of the orcs in the head and it's just like ah, oh, that fantasy is shattered oh yeah i'm watching a movie oh yeah this, you know so that's the same with a, a phrase where one note sticks out or 
or it's out of tune, all of these potential distractions for what we want, which is a wash of music. And if it's an audition for the panelists, they, yeah, the audition panel to put their pencils down and just go, hmm, yeah, that, I could play with that. And, oh, no, I like that per musical idea there. Oh, nice. I don't agree with it. But, you know, maybe I don't like it, but they did something. I want to hire that person so that I can teach them what do what I want <laughs> in the section or whatever. All that collaboration, excellent. Ooh, uh, thank you, Grace. Uh, Grace says, I think I am more scared to succeed than fail. Have you experienced this? Yes, many, 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 many times. Uh, thank you for sharing. That's really, really helpful as well. Um, the fear of success, it, it's, it's wrapped up in a lot of things as well. And one of which is, I, I deeply believe in this approach, if you want a better life, ask better questions. And not saying, Grace, your question was great. I meant the question of, do I deserve this? Like, we got to get bored with that. The world tells us if we deserve it or not. I have been, luckily, or, you know, yay, I can brag about it, maybe. You know, and I got to work with pace enough mm -hmm. to get over myself and into the music and uh, make that a, a more important thing. Um, so that's the first place I know I experienced a lot of fear of success is do I deserve it and can I keep playing at this level because for an audition I spent three months on these notes now I have to play concerts every week or with Canadian Brass we do 80 to 100 concerts a year I'm leaving tomorrow <laughs> I'm leaving tomorrow for a concert in North Carolina <clears throat> and right before this class I was like oh and I was up till 12 one o'clock playing my long notes and, and you know practicing because concerts in two days i've been practicing every day but i still today thought oh do i have enough to get through the concert because we do a concert every three weeks now so i don't but um so that can also be wrapped up in the fear of success if grace if you want to get more specific about because there's so many things we can fear about success as well uh is you know keeping up that high level of of excellence. My solution to that is I'm kind of a binge practicer. I practice now. I'm not actually this since Christmas. I'm 51 now. Now I have to do a couple hours a day to be able to play and play at the level I would like. So I have that for the rest of my life now. I used to be able to practice a little less and then a lot more a few days before the concert. Um, but that's all about self knowledge and our way through any of this fear. Fear of success, fear of failure, fear of all of these external things um, is all about how we know ourselves and how we think about it. Um, success is also a very interesting word, and it's something that we define. You know, maybe we uh, succeeded for our parents, but not for our own goals. That's, but luckily for me, I got to quit horn for three or four years. I drove my parents crazy uh, a little bit they were supportive as well but um yeah grace uh, did you are you coming in to talk a little bit about it or, um i can keep rapping about all the different ways we can fear success um but it's about why we're doing it and what our definition of success is yes grace welcome you're on the show <laughs> um yeah, no, I think you already answered my question because I wanted to know, like, of course, you practice a lot for an audition, but uh, once you get the, the job, you've got the job, what <laughs> what can you do? I mean, how can you stay on the same level when you just have a new program on the each week? And how can you, I know, I don't know, <laughs> just yeah. the same job, I've, I've got the feeling that we are practicing. Yeah, the same, but yeah absolutely. Great. What instrument do you play? Bassoon. Bassoon. Okay, I won't. I always make fun of bassoons because my sister plays bassoon, so I'm. I won't do that now. I won't. <laughs> Yay, bassoon! Um, my sister went to McGill as well. Yeah, so we're, okay. she plays in. She's she's second bassoon in Boston now. Um, so um, that 
the well, here's a couple things. One thing, the biggest thing that I just realized this year, someone talked to me about this. Another great thing about auditioning is that you get to play some of the greatest rep ever. Those excerpts are, you know, some of the greatest pieces of music. And you will never play that much rep <laughs> in a concert, <laughs> ever. You know, you play one or two of those excerpts if those pieces are on the program. Yeah. So th it's it's a different workload that, that, okay. <laughs> that we learn to handle, you know, for sure. That's the one thing. Um, I remember being, I remember the first time I got uh, principal horn at McGill. I, when I got there, I, I placed sixth, and then I placed eight, 18th. Didn't like uh, that experience as much, so I figured out a lot about my quality gap, basically, and then uh, figured out how, a little bit more and more and more about how to play my best at my first version, and then I placed second, and then first, first, and then I got a job in my third year. Um, but when I got principal, I was on my way to ask them how did this mistake happen <laughs> and if they could change it so i because i i didn't believe i could do it we were doing don juan and charangu lila symphony Bruckner eight and i didn't have a high range i i i knew i couldn't i physically couldn't play the notes once you know <laughs> it wasn't even about doing it well um but my teacher jean goudreau who i love very much another teacher of mine second horn in montreal when i was there um, and then I ended up getting to play with him. I played fourth horn with him and we roomed together on tour. It's really fun to hang out with your teacher. <laughs> Another reason to win these auditions or work, work so we end up winning. Um, but he can, he just said, you wouldn't have got this if you weren't ready. Um, there was another moment when I was, uh, I, I was asked if I wanted to be uh, president of the International Horn Society. And that's very, very much not me. I'm, I'm terrified of the people on the panel who have actual degrees and know a lot about the horn. I've always thought of myself as a, a fake or a, um, what's it called? Imposter. Imposter. Exactly. You know, I wanted to say about that. Yeah, we get, we'll get found out. <laughs> the what? The scam feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's scam. Yeah, exactly. Um, a side note before I forget, I'm sorry about le leaping around all these um, places. The, the, uh, I heard someone recently, Adam Grant, who's a wonderful thinker, um, he wrote Think Again and a few other books. Uh, and he's on this podcast called The Armchair Expert. Uh, and at one point he talks about imposter syndrome. And he just says, I think that's a mistake, imposter. Why do we have to make it a syndrome? Everybody has these thoughts. And why don't we just call it a, we have an imposter thought here and now here. And now I'm well rested and I'm well practiced and I'm in the zone and I don't feel like an imposter for this second. Oh wait, this could happen. Okay, I am one for this moment. <laughs> and that's life. We have that coming regardless of what we do with our life. Um, and it's, you know, whether we deserve it or not, it's these crazy things. So the International Horn Society thing it became evident that I could become the president. I was scared enough just to be on the council for two years. And then they asked me, I called my wife. It was in London, England at the time. And I called my wife to see if we had time for me to do this. And then I said, okay, I guess. And I, I thought still, I wasn't ready. I didn't deserve it. Didn't deserve it. And, um, but I read a book, I saw this book called Rise, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who the, the author is, but there was a, I think, an Emily Dickinson quote that said, you don't know how high you've climbed until you're called to rise. So it's this, you know, it's that, that balancing of you see an audition list, okay, am I gonna do this? Yeah, I guess so, like, where am I? I'm called to rise to the opportunity a thousand times a day it's not about that last moment it's about the three months before and the hundreds of choices a, a day how we do manage those that get us to where we've risen and then we get called to rise and win a win a bassoon job well, now what uh but the, i mean the other thing is you just you don't know what you're being called into so the fear is crazy but it will also help us. <laughs> I do a lot of, I get out of the couch a lot of times because of fear. I call it good fear. 
Um, and so that first rehearsal, I remember the first rehearsal for me in the Montreal Symphony, I was out of my mind, scared, terrified. And I still am, you know, because having played with a bunch of different orchestras and going all over the place, every first day of school, I call it first day of school, I have those jitters and I have played the pieces with the recordings a few times. I have my own parts. I've marked it up in red. I'm ready for the performance when I show up for first rehearsal, as we've all heard that we should be doing all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, but I'm still scared out of my mind and not breathing and, and doing all I can. And then after about 15 minutes, I'm in there. Ah, oh, there's, there's 70, 80, 90 people on stage. It's not all about me. I'm the one making it all about me. <laughs> um, my sister plays bassoon, second, second bassoon in Boston. She uh, had an un a very hard experience with Dutrois once in Montreal about Beethoven 9, third movement. Everybody know the second bassoon solo at the beginning of Beethoven 9? Me neither. Um, it starts in that third movement, the, the second bassoon goes and then the first bassoon I don't know if I'm in the right key, but um, and that note didn't speak once for my sister and she was traumatized for years and years and years. She was in Montreal for a while then she went to Boston and but I talked her I talked her through it each time she had to do it, and now she's past those choices of fear. Um, and it's, she's a cog on a wheel. <laughs> she's just a part of this massive experience for the audience. And for Beethoven 9, everyone's there for the last movement anyway. They don't know this third movement. Uh, as a fourth horn player, <laughs> the second bassoon being scared for those two notes, fourth horn has a huge, the only bit large solo for fourth horn ever. Uh, and that was the first thing I played. In Winnipeg, Beethoven 9, Fourth Horn. They did a Beethoven series at the beginning of my, my year. So I had to sit and watch Beethoven 1 through 8, scared out of my mind, you know, and then, okay, you're on for Beethoven 9. <laughs> the first time, there's a scale. If you know the symphony, and it's horn alone. Full choir behind me, full orchestra ahead, and a full audience every single time. And the world just stopped when that moment came. I think my hands are shaking a little bit even now. <laughs> it's such a moment. But I just played one note at a time. Um, and so the way through this is to practice performing. Uh, and we'll, I'll get to the next question in the chat. Uh, um, um, but th that's how I learned, is we practice walking into the room and you practice the choices that, that we make when we walk into performance and try to make them as constructive as possible, as often as possible. And then just develop a repertoire or arsenal of fear replacements. So fearless performance is not the lack of fear, but more the choice that there are things more important than fear over and over and over again. Sometimes I go for seven seconds in a row in a performance without a fearful thought. But those fears can guide us to tending to things. You know, when I mark my parts, I try and have more musical markings than technical markings of arrows and pitch things. I want phrasing and shapes and style nudges in on my parts. But if it's something in the dress rehearsal that I've missed, I circle it in the dress rehearsal. I know why I circled it because I clipped that note in the, in the dress rehearsal. So concert time, I know to do a little bit less, or I end up doing a little bit less music for that moment and I go technical for a second and just in my mind and in my technique I I make a little bit more sure that I get that note but I'm still spending so much music around it that it doesn't destroy the story and how do we do that by making our routine the most amazing musical experience ever I never warm up don't think you're warming up ever I think that's you're wasting time. You're wasting very valuable learning opportunities. Warming up is something that we do every day to get the physical going, maybe to get our mind going. But I want to make the first note I play uh, just a pearl, an amazing musical note, that, even that first note, you know. And then reality happens. It doesn't have to be an amazing note. My lips could be really stiff or whatever happens. And then I tend to that. My sound tells me what I need to be doing that day. But that's, I think, one of the other things. If if we have room to make this time matter more, it actually says to me that I haven't made all the other times matter enough. So if I make every note be full of musical 
you know, um, mattering value and <laughs> purpose. There we go. Um, that I never have to make more music. Phil Myers, the uh, former first horn in New York Philharmonic, uh, and his first job was actually Symphony of Nova Scotia. It was kind of cool. Um, he said, I don't go out there to play my best anymore. I just go out there to play like me. That's genius. Just, it's me and my horn and my music. If someone, you know, I'm alone. Okay, I'm comfortable. I've decided that I'm comfortable. Someone walks in, I, I can either freak out. You know, we do freak out. We freak ourselves out, right? If we hear the door open when we think we're alone. Oh, no, we freak out. We look, oh, it's a kid. It's a five-year-old kid. Oh, okay. So then, oh, wait, that's my teacher's kid. Oh, no. Oh, wait, and there's my teacher behind them. Oh, no. All these choices. Meanwhile, it's still me, my horn, and the music and any opportunities that I can remind myself are there, or any problems and tests and scary things. These are my choices. I am not saying this is easy. Um, it's become easier for me as I go and as I make these things into habits, but uh, yeah, it's not easy, but keeping it simple can help. Uh, do your job, something I write on my inspirational sheet, like execute, like an Olympic athlete be in there and do it in that way um but yeah don't if you um have to go in there to play your best you might make one percent more music go for just that little bit more in in an audition or a concert concert it's probably a little bit maybe a little more allowed or a good idea but in an excerpt in excerpts for three months i've been preparing it um if I change 1% of my technician and go for 1% more music, I'm, I have a different technician. That's why I, we miss more notes, maybe when we go for more music or change and really go for it in concert. This was a discussion I had with my studio at Indiana University. What does going for it really mean? And going for it can be very destructive. If you change what you've planned for months and years, um, go for the music. Uh, you know, throw caution to the wind. That works for some people. If it works for you, keep doing it. Absolutely. But for me, I am executing what I've planned. Um, and I come out and greet the audience. Hello. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Focus in on that music and my job and my colleagues. I'm sending the music out. I, care, I do care about my audience, but I need all my mental resources on what serves my execution of that music and my sharing of what's important, when I'm the melody, when I'm the harmony, all these other things that serve my job and my opportunity. Um, okay, that was a really long message about um, fearing success and how to... Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for asking, Grace. Okay, another question. This is great. I'm scared of the domino effect of making a mistake during performance. It's a real, very real thing, this, this enjoyable spiral into... A dark abyss. Yay. Uh, I make a mistake and keep thinking about that mistake while I play, which makes me nervous and upset, which leads to more mistakes and repeat. I have a hard time letting go of those mistakes and they impact the rest of my performance. It's easy to fall into that spiral of negativity. How do you climb out of it during a performance? Okay, I'll be specific. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, so again, I, I will start with talking about responsibility um, because if, yeah, that's a, a really important aspect of this. I talk, you know, talk to my students and if you know my student says, uh, the audience made me nervous, I say, sorry, what? And they say, uh, I let the audience make me nervous, to which I still say, sorry, what? Uh, and, it's, and then they say, uh, I chose to get nervous. I might have chosen to get nervous because of the audience, um, but that Eleanor Roosevelt quote, that no one can make me feel anything without my consent, my emotional intelligence is up to me, my choices of what matters. Um, and then it, I really love the nuance that, like, what is missing a note? Is missing a note just if the audience can tell, just if I can tell, or if just a computer can tell? If it's one cent sharp, I missed the note, maybe. So that is one thing that has made it laughable for me to decide maybe here. I mean I well, so there's the reality of what an audience can hear is a missed note there is that but I like unpacking it in ways that have me let go of of how right I am about my mistakes and then also if you've ever recorded yourself uh and thought you did horribly and then listened and went oh whew, that's not that's not so bad uh 
And when I had to quit Hornet, it was because my next decision was always, oh, okay, then I can practice less. <laughs> uh, good enough is the enemy of great. So, um, but you're talking about during performance, and but the, it's my first thought and learning opportunity or getting back my flow. I don't like the word control. You know, the control is an illusion. We don't control things. Planes land on buildings and. Unless we, as as a French horn player as well, there's a saying: um, "Man, where man plans and God laughs." Uh, same French horn player plans and then blows into the instrument, <laughs> and the horn laughs. Um, <clears throat> so, if my okay, I keep wanting to talk about not getting into that spin in the first place, and I'll do that in a minute. But get, uh, it's presence; it's getting onto my next note and that's it and nothing more i'm obsessive about um every you know I, so i use an inspirational sheet when i do auditions and concerts and there's lots of things written on it they want you to play well um tell them the music uh go for death all these different things play for nina my wife and i have all these little things that help me go to better places than uh oh um along the way um so one of one of, and then one of those things is every excerpt is the only excerpt and that's i play an excerpt I, I, I walk in put the inspirational sheet there and read it again even from walking backstage i read it every excerpt is the only excerpt okay what's the only thing they're going to hear hmm. okay mozart concerto okay good. that's the only thing you're going to hear <clears throat> and at first that's a source of more fear but i I walk in front of 50 people before the actual audition so i get used to thinking that and figuring out how to make it work. Um, and then I play that that piece as well as I can. As soon as the sound is gone, take the inspirational sheet out again, and I'm emptying my horn. Every excerpt is the only excerpt. Oh, yeah, OK. So what are they hearing today? What's the only thing I'm playing for them today? The past is gone. OK. Oh, pictures that next mission. OK, that's the only thing. So I put everything into this one, and not everything like the loudest I can play and the fastest or whatever, but everything in the context of this excerpt that I've worked up and executed as well as I can. Let's get through that one. Okay, every excerpt is the only excerpt. Oh yeah, okay, oh, Don Juan. Um, there was a, uh, an audition that I ended up winning. Um, there's many that I didn't end up winning. Um, and I've Don Juan was one of the excerpts and uh, I went to play it and I went, and it's the, the big horn tootie call and i went spia spia da, dun, da, da, dun, da. I, but i just went spia spia i missed the first two notes very impressive and i stopped and then i was like okay and just habitually i took the inspiration sheet out and, and looked at it and turned the page uh, and i felt the proctor coming over to say you know you can't skip that excerpt you have to play it and then i turned back to don juan and i went oh don juan Oh, I love this excerpt. Nice. I did all my prep again for the first time and played it and played it, not played it again. I played it 10 minutes ago too in the warm up room. This is all just kind of length of memory, what situations we put in for ourselves. Um, but we can play those games with, with our minds. And I ended up winning that. I mean, that audition, which is an important factor that the panel forgave it, uh, but also we make the mistake when we stop uh we make the mistake of thinking uh oh now we really have to nail it no i really had to nail it the first time too <laughs> so this added pressure is self self-caused uh, and the same with keeping score during a performance my mother who teaches singing says if you're listening and the audience is listening then who's singing so that and that listening factor is about having a past and keeping score and so that's that is the thing that goes into my get present on like serve serve everything i can right now learn later i'll i'll do better next it's already happened nothing we can do about it you know that already even though that doesn't that alone doesn't help me in the act of, of performance but getting getting present and uh, and the, the best way that happens for me is counting i count louder i get my sense of timing as loud as possible and if it ends up filling my head so i can get on the next note um, quicker 
um, and it's an impressive thing in auditions. If we, I've made huge, I've, I've missed notes in every audition I've won. I've missed notes in every audition I've lost. Um, but all, um, when I miss a note, it's, I guess it was wrapped enough in that storytelling thing that it stayed hireable, I guess, you know, and those panelists are, are human beings who are, who all know they're imperfect. And if they have, do think they're perfect, you probably won't end up hanging out with them very much when you get the job. Um, yeah, so it's a bunch of now, now, now. My job is just now, 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 not now, now, now. Oh, that was really bad. You made that mistake. No, now, 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 now. Oh, you made that mistake again. What are you doing? What are you? And all this. Unpack it in the practice room. Do it later. And you can make it better once you get backstage and get ready for your next performance. But you're in the throes of this performance right now. And it's performance intelligence. Basically, what matters. One of the big differences between the practice room and performing is that there is there's no past except what informs maybe if your colleague is playing high today or rushing something then that helps but not how am i doing and emotional scoreboards are are only destructive equally destructive as now and now, now. oh that was really good i just did that whoa now no that no it was awesome way to go jeff uh, the, now 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 just execute um yeah, and I'm always shocked whenever I play my absolute best. I'm like, ooh, that was really, you know, but not during performance. That's what we get to enjoy when we listen to the recording or negotiate your contract for your job or whatever. Um, I hope that helps. I think that's the, that's the one big um, way of, yeah, again, I say presence, counting, getting into the musical phrase and get into things more important than how I did on that last note. It is gone. Yeah. Uh, and that we can practice as well by practicing performing. And we can do that in our kitchen to a photo of whoever we choose to get the most scared of. I was going to say whoever scares us, but we're choosing to be scared. <laughs> Put the photo of that person and walk in and play right to them. Okay. Another question? Um, yeah, my mother. That's the scaring thing, yeah. Okay, I'm scared to have to keep tuning a lot and to have to find a way to deal with out of tune strings during a performance. Uh, I never had that fear, actually. It could be the French horn aspect of the French horn. Um, but I definitely have a lot of tuning <laughs> fears. Um, so I have to find a way to deal with out of tune strings during a performance whenever you tr I travel for an audition or a competition because of humidity changes. Uh -huh, good question. Um, my first source of of calming would be that everyone has to deal with that so i'm not alone i'm not the only one that's having to deal with that uh, and that only might help me emotionally not in reality to tending to those the humidity changes same with bassoon and all that yeah horn we're lucky it's waterproof and metal it doesn't change all that much um but it's one of my favorite sayings is also find focus in the chaos and uh, so it's what can I affect and what can't I affect and know what I can and do what I can, but then surrender and, and uh, embrace what I can affect. The three big um, ideas for fearless performance is learn, love well, let go. Learn, love well, let go. Um, and I've changed it recently to learn what we can love well so that we end up letting go. That letting go is a result of loving well. And we're here to learn what to love well. So love the performance opportunities, love the realities. Um, and, you know, every violinist in the world deals with those humidity changes and they, the, they figure out how to be in tune enough. Uh, that's the, you know, an enough, not enough line. And I know you're figuring it out as well. And being scared of that can help you do the work that we need, you know, in order to transcend humidity. <laughs> I'm sorry. First off, I'm sorry that, that you have to deal with that. Um, at the high level of excellence, everything has, has different challenges. You know, yeah, I used to say, you know, singers, they have their stories already written for them. It's in the in the libretto and it's so much easier for them. And then I married an opera singer. Actually, I had opera singer parents as well, but opera singing wife 
you know, they get their stories written for them, but they have to sing in French, Italian, German, Latin, whatever. <laughs> so, and I just have to go to, to, ta, 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 ta. So, and violin, you have your, all your challenges that our job is to turn them into opportunities. Audition winning is opportunity seizing. And we end up letting go of the things that we, we can't tend to everything. Um, but this audition is not my last one, so I will do my very, very best in my preparation for it. Go out on stage and execute as well as I can uh, and find out what happened. I'm going to give talk to you about the training system. Maybe we can take a little five minute break and um, uh, uh, stretch our legs and everything. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. As for, it's yeah, I, I talk to myself as as nicely as possible and yet kind of as tough love as possible that I can I can affect what I can um, and yeah other people seem to sound amazing every day so and they're human and I've that's one of the gifts I'm 51 now but even at McGill I got to spend time with the people that were in the orchestra and realize that they're scared too and they're human and uh, Pete Sullivan uh, was the principal trombone there. He's now principal in Pittsburgh. He's been there for a long time. But my one of my friends at McGill was studying with him, and we got to hang out with Pete Sullivan sometimes at Peel Pub. Um, but we called him one day and, and was like, "Hey, we're going for a beer. You want to come?" And he was like, <laughs> "He just went. I'm Mahler seven tonight," and and he just hung up on us, and we were like that's weird. He didn't even want to come hang out. And I'll never forget that. You know, that was 92, a long time ago. Um, so it is, it's a pain. It's, it's a life and it, there's um, sacrifices that are worth it, but it's figuring all that stuff out and hopefully telling you that that fear of it will help you, will get you to tend to it. And you tend to it as well as you can. And your job is to stand backstage and, love well what you can and end up letting go of the fear of that because it's too late at that point. No shoulda, coulda, wouldas standing backstage. It's execution time when we walk on stage and we practice doing that. So we do the best with what we have. I like the idea that um, this enough, not enough line, even for intonation, you know, um, it's, it's all, uh, I'm, I've had people come into a lesson and, and play for eight bars and then on the ninth bar they miss a note and they stop and I'm, I'm like oh that's interesting okay so the missed note is enough to stop for but these eight bars here where you didn't have much phrasing musical uh, emotional purchase and investment those were okay you know and there you know a few intonation little things but it's the missed note that was bad enough to stop for um that we're gloriously imperfect who are we to decide you know and that's what's up to the panel and the competition panel uh our job is just to get as good as we can and take that on st out on stage and execute it as close as possible to our best you all know this <laughs> but a computer can look at the greatest performance ever and find a million mistakes with it right oh this is out of tune you know you can look at the second best performance live ever and find a million mistakes with it who are we to just say this one's better than this one you know the computer's going what they're both completely full of mistakes so the embracing of glorious imperfection helps me um get my cognitive load on what i can affect get my mind my mental resources to go where their best serve to get me to my definition of success, which is playing in tune and playing and to in tune enough and phrasing and uh, showing some of my own musical ideas in concert over and over and over again. We get to practice that. Uh, uh, so I hope that helps a little bit with the, the fear of, of intonation. You know, uh, it, I, I, one day, I uh, was working on my intonation a lot and my life changed when I saw this one graphic. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second, I was, I called my sister, second bassoon in Boston. I have two sisters, one is a flute player. Uh, and then the bassoonist, the second bassoon knows intonation, right? Who knows intonation better than a second bassoonist? And um, I called her and I said, what do you do for intonation? And she says, uh, I play with a tuner for about an hour a day. And I'm like, okay, but what else? What else? You know, and then she started talking about reed making. So I, hung up um but just kidding well no actually uh 
but I saw this grab and I was uncomfortable uh, working on my intonation because it just, I come back to it and okay, now this note's out of tune. Okay, now this note, now what do I do? You know, I just, and then I got more specific to the intonation tendencies. So that's something else that we can be learning is with humidity, there are probably tendencies and the people who play more and more, better and better in tune consistently with humidity changes are the ones who understand that about themselves and their instrument um, well enough to do that. Um, but I saw this graphic. It's three circles inside each other. The first circle is, it says your comfort zone, your comfort zone. It's the first circle. Then the second one is your learning zone. And then the third one outside is your panic zone. Uh, and I just, oh, I was uncomfortable with my intonation work, comfort zone, out of your comfort zone. There's a learning zone in between panic <laughs> and comfort. And I think we make the mistake too often of panicking when we're uncomfortable. So comfort zone's great, but I like thinking there's no learning in comfort zone. That also helps me be super comfortable and relaxed and turn it off in the comfort zone. Right, that I'm just I'm there to recharge and enjoy life and do other things. It's great, but to learn even in my if I'm doing a a warm up or doing the routine the same every day, I'm in my comfort zone and there isn't learning. So mix up your routines and do different things so that it's um, it's okay to be uncomfortable. And when we're uncomfortable, we can embrace the learning opportunities there before we panic. Don't skip that learning zone in the middle, I think. Um, shall we take a quick little five minute break? See you at, in five minutes. Okay. Welcome back everyone. Let's talk a little bit about how we can train for these things so that our choices get a little more automatic or easier to embrace. Um, there's some science stuff at work here, uh, habit forming and uh, a fantastic book uh, by James Clear that's called um, uh, Atomic Habits. And I will put that in the chat as well. Uh, by James Clear. It's a wonderful book on um, getting our lives to be less about changing maybe changing the thing that we do, but changing our systems around what we do, changing our environment. So it facilitates practicing well, or I call it my practice shrine, uh, that area that I, where I practice, just have it be conducive to constructive thought um, and timing. And I have, a, you know, I have, a, I have actually my phone has a tuner, but I have it going to the television. So my tuner, <laughs> It's huge. Um, and just how, you know, that environment influence is really helpful along the way. But the habits are forming because in our brains we make choices. And the more often we make choices, the brain myelinates. It's like a, myel a myelin sheath that goes around those circuit uh, pathways where that choice was made. And we are, human beings are our habit, you know, easy quick quick way hungry so uh with our pursuits of that our brains make like driving like walking all this learning are for our choices and the more often we make them they become habits so and the bad news is our bodies don't discern between good and bad habits we just learn habits so it's up to us to choose in ways that have us ending up <laughs> building the habits that have us go toward our definitions of success. Um, so um, I break, let's break down that there's uh, two things I'll talk about. I'll talk about maybe the practicing performing first and then a system through which you can manage your time and, and training resources really quickly. The magic line performance method is the way that I practice performing. And it's based around this magic line. There's a magic line between backstage and on stage. And uh, every time we approach this line, we bring every choice we've made our entire lives. Dun, dun, dun. Could be a uh, source of a lot of fear or also inspiration to clean up our choices. Um, but usually if 
it's uh, if we're freaking out a lot then that inspiration for cleaning up our choices has to wait till next time because <laughs> we're right at the line we're right about to go on stage um so note that okay i can i need to perform these more before performance actual um but backstage right at that line that is not the time for shoulda coulda i shoulda practiced more too bad too late we're about to walk on stage and to be in a little bit different arena where some choices um, are different, have different answers in, in performance stage. And we learn about all this by going through the magic line performance method. It's a 10 step thing. You stand backstage and uh, get ready to perform. And uh, uh, I will share the, the PDF with everyone uh, after we're, we're finished here as well. Okay. I mean, um, stand backstage and I read an inspirational sheet. It says things on it like they want you to play well. Um, every excerpt is the only excerpt. Uh, I watched Rocky before one audition, so I wrote, Yo, Adrian, down the side. <laughs> Anything. Pictures. I have one student whose uh, his inspiration sheet is just six pictures of Beyonce. Fabulous pictures of her. And that inspired him. He won a few auditions. Uh, yeah. So whatever speaks to you. You look at it. You look at it. You stand backstage. And you go through this process. I did it in my, as I said before, in my kitchen. Um, I'll talk about the system of setting up magic line performances in a minute. So you, you, the, the goal of this is you stand backstage, you walk on, on stage and you perform and then you success collect what I call success collecting, saying one thing that went well, that you did well, um, and then leave. And that's the whole performance i'll do one for you i'll do one now <clears throat> um okay let's see i have this shelf here so i'll do it i'll pretend that i'm standing but um i can't see the screen it doesn't matter actually. all right i hello my name is jeff nelson uh please do not applaud for me when i come back I'm simulating an audition, so I will be entering to silence. And today I will play for you the opening to Till Eulenspiegel, a piece written by Richard Strauss. And Richard's father was a horn player as well, so he Richard ended up writing a lot of wonderful things for horn. And Till Eulenspiegel tells the story of a jester who has to be funny enough to save his own life. Meanwhile, there's three dead jesters at his feet. He's in front of the queen. We wish him luck. Come back here and I read my inspirational sheet. I want you to play well. Inspirational sheet again. I want you to play well. Go to what I call a focus point sheet. It's a post it note next to my music, on my music. Picture of Tillard and Spiegel. Like that. Um, light dance just like a jester is written there and crisp fronts are my three and one technical goal at the end of my story start the orchestra in my head stand up and bow and then success collect out loud this is things that we do in, in the not in the event actual but uh and then i conveyed the sharp metal bottoms of two and spiegel's shoes by having crisp fronts on my first three notes and that's the whole magic that's one magic line it takes one minute and uh, i've just put myself into a bunch of different situations that uh, help me choose throughout. Um, one is to not play horn with noise cancelling headphones. On. <laughs> Shoot, I just made an excuse. Um, the other thing of taking responsibility and quietly going, oh, okay, I gotta remember that for next time instead of uh, 
verbalizing it out loud. See me? I'm just squirming in my seat. I still have 51. I have some good jobs. I've played all over and I still freak out. Uh, I hope that helps. I'm doing this on purpose. No, I'm not. It's just, the, the struggle is real. Um, but we have choices and we can calm down. And I've just completely calm myself because there's nothing I can do about it. I just keep having to remind myself of that. And I'm not perfect. And uh, yeah, uh, the, I mean, another thing that helps me is that I could play uh, the absolute best I've ever played in my entire life. And someone can say, well, that was horrible. And I can play as the worst possible that I've ever thought. And someone could say, that's amazing. You know, and those, that's the spectrums, right? But then there's every audition, every round that I walked out of, I thought I played horribly. You know, oh, I missed this in the real myopic small details. I missed this and then they called me to the next round. What? So let that be up to them. You just be in there, stay in as, as constructive a place as possible for as long as possible. Discover when you're thinking fearful thoughts and getting destructive as soon as possible and optimal reset back to, or not back, forward into a place of, a safe place <laughs> again, a place of either constructive thought about what you're gonna do or a completely distracted, stupid fantasy place that you're in Disneyland right now. Whatever works for you. And distraction isn't bad, or it is, don't do it, but it works. It, my wife does a bunch of auditions as an opera singer and she plays Candy Crush. Uh, solitaire, and then it was Candy Crush for a long time. And, she, and now, you know, one of the guidelines for me is no waiting. Don't put yourself in a state of waiting. Get a life. <laughs> to read a book. Get into doing something else, playing Candy Crush. Now you're doing this instead of waiting for this other thing and spending energy on all this stuff that's coming regardless. All this stuff we can learn also by performing for people a lot. So this is the training in thirds system what I've used a lot and uh, what um, one quick story of uh, Tom Sherwood, who uh, was principal percussion in Atlanta. Um, and he was getting my blogs. I was reading, writing a blog every week for a year. And then my five-year-old was born. Um, so it's been five years since I wrote that blog, but I was writing it and he wrote me one day and, and said, Hey, I've been reading your blogs and I really enjoyed it. I need to mix things up a bit and try something different. I've got to, finals of some auditions, but I really want to see if working with you can help. So we did Magic Lines. He performed every week for me for a couple of months uh, leading up to his audition for the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, and he's in the Cleveland Orchestra. It worked and he loved the process. He'll say that that really added to his audition success. Uh, and one of the things why I bring it up is <clears throat> that inspirational sheet. And he wrote a, a big thing about this, that at, at first, the Magic Line Performance Method, for the first, I don't know, the first 20 times he did it, he said that he was probably more distracted by trying to remember this aspect. Okay, now what do I do? Now I read the sheet or do I do, you know? Um, but after 10 or 20 times, he said that those performance aspects became habits and he freed up more of his mental resources to be able to think about the things that mattered, like like playing the 20 different instruments that he has to play. His, his audition book was 126 pages. Um, yeah, because he's got to play tam-tam and bass drum and tambourine and snare drum and all these different things. Um, but yeah, the last, the last thing he did two days before, it was a big pencil drop. I was just like, wow, that's all music. And I didn't think I had much to contribute to him three months earlier when he started playing all these excerpts and that, that Porgy and Bess, you know, that xylophone or marimba thing. Um, he played it and it was amazing. But I was like, uh, if I'm an idiot, this is how I teach. If I'm an idiot and not looking at the part, I, I lost where beat one was here in this thing. Like, do you want that turned around? We talked about phrasing. We talked about all the stuff that singers talk about and string players, all you melody players that play all the melodies. Um, yeah, so the, we always, so that's kind of the way we look at our performances when we record them and look at them after after the fact. Um, but he said after those first twenty, then I mean he had just he by the time he walked into the audition, he said he had his his inspirational sheet was a book uh, open, um, 
I think execute was the word in the middle circled and then he had all these other words around it circled and it was just this this word wash um, but he said when he went into the audition he just had the book in his pocket and he'd think about it every time he'd go to the because I mean for him he has to keep changing instruments and <laughs> time was of the essence as well so here's the system and this, this is what he followed through as well um also um i worked quite a bit with teresa rudolph viola in toronto symphony she loves the system as well really um it's a good structure let me stop talking about talking about it so there's thirds and if let's say you have three months before your performance audition competition whatever it is three months boom boom, boom. every month is a third three weeks it works for three weeks it works for three days whatever you got um first third is your build phase your second third is your share phase and the third third is your b phase b e is being um share is the greatest word i can come up with for performance share what or no sorry shares in the middle build your building and so this whole first month um and this build share b are the priorities that you have for all these times uh, you're still practicing all you know throughout each but your priorities are, diff are different for each third first third of build and you're learning the score you're figuring out you have the music on in the background 24 7 so you can just hear what you're playing and you just hear very loudly uh, the people you're playing with at this point and this point and the different things that your audience is experiencing you're marking your intonation tendencies learning all the notes uh, and then you're getting your life in order as well with habits of hydration and rest and telling your friends that you're in training mode don't ask me to go to a movie but you can ask me to play an excerpt for you or whatever play this movement of the concerto um yeah for montreal i think you know i didn't watch movies for two months three months and then i watched 12 movies after i won the audition it's great and you want that that incredible experience of being done <gasps> and having gotten that success. Uh, it's a lot of work, it really is. Um, I know you know this, you're, in, you're playing at this level. Um, getting to all that building, and at the end of your first third, uh, and, or the first day of your second third, which is called share, you're performing for someone. And every day of share and be, you're performing for someone. Online, it's become easier than ever, then you get that experience of waking up each day knowing you have a performance but one of the bonus um benefits of this training in thirds came when a student of mine came in freaking out one day and he was like ah, i have to play the opening of held laban i'm like i know but you have four more weeks until the, the audition or whatever and he's like no my first third is over today you know i have to play it tomorrow you know and he played it better than i'd ever heard him play so that urgency helped him practice well um but also, you know, that urgency of having all your notes figured out at the end of your first third, instead of you have three months to do it. I know I do not act uh, as well with that urgency. I work, I, there's a wonderful TED Talk, uh, The Art of Procrastination, or he's a procrastination expert. And he says, okay, I did my dis I've had my dissertation. And here's the first third, second third, third third finished, you know, and then the first month disappeared so now my workload is up here and then the second month disappeared and now my workload and then the last week and then finally it was like the whole dissertation got pinned into the last day and then he said i ran and i threw the dissertation in handed it in at 4 59 on that day and they called me after and they said it was the greatest paper they'd ever written Okay, that didn't happen. <laughs> I just wanted you to think I was that guy. Um, it was really funny. Yeah, it's a wonderful TED Talk on that. And he talks about the uh, procrastination monkey, the chaos monkey. Tim Urban, thank you, Eric. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is the procrastination monkey? Something crazy monkey in your mind um, that, that messes things up. Ooh, I need to go look at crazy stuff on YouTube and I'll get to it later. And we have three months of time, right? The procrastination dopamine of doing new things rather than sitting in that room for three or four hours a day so knowing you have that performance at the beginning of your second third um really does inspire your work a lot now in the second third is your share phase so you've built and you've built your stories as well but a 
all these different emotions and visuals to your to your music. So you're not just playing the notes and regurgitating well, but you're telling a story of love, loss, life, all these things, licorice, whatever works. Um, build, share, share, share. And so you're going through the process of performing for different people, walking into a room, seeing what you do to yourself, um, you know, and put fear on yourself and how you can solve and replace that fear over and over daily and then practice and practice the way you've been doing it but with that with that awareness of um of sharing and that there's an audience involved as well uh and then the third third you're still performing for everybody but this is your b phase and this is the one that's most often neglected um that your priority shifts from sharing or building, you know, getting the greatest story possible and the greatest tips from people. That's what you're doing in the share, in that second third of share. You're also you're sharing with others and you're also sharing in the building of your stories and what your definition of success is for each excerpt or each piece. Um, and you also learn how to take critique constructively because you're getting it every day. And once you play, your job is to sit there and listen and go, okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh -huh. You know, not, oh, you know, when they say that, that, that note's too, too loud, whatever. You know, as abrasive as some people can be with their comments, it's still their opinions. Uh, if it's someone in the orchestra in that section, you have to <laughs> listen to their opinions a little more. If it's someone who plays out of tune a lot, you can let those, that note was out of tune, you can let those comments go by, right? And go, okay, but still just going, thank you, okay. Long way. But if you go, oh, really? While well, people are giving you um, critique, then maybe that person's going to slow down for you and be a little more careful and not give you maybe all the critique that they would have if you were like, okay, yeah, thanks, okay. You know, every time. I had my first lesson with Dale Clevenger before the Chicago audition. And I, I walked out of there like just a puddle of useless, found out imposter. Um, and I had already played with the Montreal Symphony and I was in the Vancouver Symphony at the time and playing well, I thought, you know, but he showed me a whole new level of what, how soft it could be and all these things. Um, but when I listened to the recording, uh, he just said, that's attitude, that's attitude, all these different things. And I just kept saying, okay, thanks. So in that lesson, I just, all I said was, thank you. Thank you. And then I think that encourages people to give very objective critique a lot more often. And the question I kept asking myself, are you going to do the work? Yes or no. Uh, and if I am, then good, go do it. Right. Along the way. Um, Sylvie, could you uh, mute your, your microphone, please? Awesome. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Um, third, third. This is the B phase and you, the thing that is most neglected. You are figuring out what you need to do to play your best on your first version. It's less about story construction and score study. You've done that and you've built the greatest stories possible because you've had these two months plus your whole life. So this is this has to be the best version you've been so far. <laughs> and if not, embrace where you are still. And you've done the commitment stuff over here. You're on this track. In the third third, you are now taking it out there and sitting down and obsessing about mm -hmm. how you can reduce your quality gap, not make your stories more true to the score, but to play as close as possible to what your plan is and your best imagined version that everyone else has talked to you about in these first two thirds. Um, you're still getting critique from people and you're still taking it, but it's the priority is less on finding that last great idea and more about self-knowledge. You're learning what you need, what crazy things you need to, I mean, behind the scenes, there's a lot of things that we have to do to make a line sound simple, right? Steady air, it's a great idea, but steady air does not, a steady air alone does not make a simple phrase if it's going up two octaves and <laughs> on a horn. Um, steady air on a violin and even less, so it's even less helpful. Um, so there's, we have to figure out what our own unique, like I say, you know, get in the cells of each note of each excerpt. You got it takes so much time to get it audition winning ready. Um, and then to execute at that level. But this is how we can do it in this through this system of 
changing priorities, evolving the priorities. In the last phase, you're in your first phase, you're in your cave of building and getting it to be as great as you can make it. Freaking out, you know, getting upset too, and not managing all these things. Second phase there, you take it out into the world. What does everybody think? Everybody. What do you think? What do you think? Great. Mm -mm, letting that one go by. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and the third phase into a different cave. Maybe it's more of a greenhouse where you're in there and you're sharing, but you're, you're growing who you are. Wow. Did I just, was that, that's pretty cool. I like that greenhouse. Go into your greenhouse so they can see you. You can be vulnerable to your work and still be sharing. And, and then the audition is just performance number 84. Pace, please come in. Pace. They've heard enough of my voice, I think. Absolute <sighs> I don't want to hear your voice too, Pace. Um, so that's the training in thirds system. And then there's a care, there's five modules actually we've made on a, my business partner, Katie Webb, and I, she's a, um, a doctor of music cognition and French horn performance, does a lot of both. Uh, and we made a five module prepare, build, share, be, care. And the care is getting ready for the circle to begin again and go around. Um, that's on the Op Collective, the, the course. There's a free fearless performance course in there before where you can get the information on how to build an audition book. Um, actually, I'll show that to you now. This is an example of an audition book. I'm going to keep talking until hopefully Pace comes in. Um, so this is the first thing I do. I, I kind of, I put on a few movies at night and I have a mild, not mild obsession with, um, uh, what's it called? Staples or Office Depot, all the stationary supplies. So I have a binding machine and all the colored tabs and I make myself an audition book uh, or a recital book or orchestral rep. I do the same for orchestra pieces. Sometimes if I have a lot of stuff in a month, I make a book for that month. When I was doing the International Horn Society uh, symposium performances, plus a concerto, plus <laughs> an orchestra thing, I just had it in order. And I had a program at the beginning. I had some inspirational stuff at the top. And then the next page, this is an example of an IU Indiana placement audition. I have the list on the next page. So whatever the repertoire and dates of the concerts, the concerts. And then for each piece, I fill out this sheet, these sheets excerpt as research and reference. This is before the first piece uh, sheet music on the in the book. Um, composer name, date, <clears throat> composer biography, date and place of the premiere performance. Just all of this study helps me become less of a um, imposter. I sleep a little better having known this stuff. My son is learning uh, Lieberstrom right now. That's list piece. And uh, we're looking him up last night and doing different, you know, learning more and more about him. And he was like, okay, yeah, now I know a little more about all these people who commissioned the piece, who were the first performers and events uh, and world events, other things going on when that piece was written. Just to do that study really, ah, I know more now. I have big potential for feeling like an imposter. I don't have my bachelor's degree. I'm a professor. Like most people I teach have more of a degree than me. Just I keep going to my strengths and serving what can serve that moment. Same with this repertoire purpose for this excerpt. You can type in here. Hope the music holds opportunities I will seize. This is good self-talk, right? Audition winning is opportunity seizing. So the premier performance, what was the audience? Non-musician audience member moved by. Oh, I guess, I don't know how many non-musicians there were. Um, any aspects of sound in your instrument, colors, textures, just to be exploding it beyond regurgitation or mistake avoidance sounds um everyone else playing around your excerpt what are they doing visuals like an opera or a movie and then a story happening and then this here is for, for each excerpt what the version i will share um what are the things what are my strengths basically or well, varying these sounds um the bonus is i get the opportunity to impress my panel i will end up impressing them if i go toward these things. Phil Myers also said he used to hide his weaknesses before going into auditions. That didn't go very well. So then he said, okay, what if I just give him my strengths? But I don't think we know our strengths. I didn't think about my strengths too much. I was too obsessed with 
my problems and weaknesses. So this is about your strengths. And then this one, where will my work be? Most candidates and I could do better on this excerpt. And then how can I work on this? The aspects that I can make sound surprisingly easy. Ooh. Favorite recordings of this one excerpt. <clears throat> Why you like each one. Average temp tempi. Don't just listen to your favorite recording because that your favorite recording could be a crazy half tempo one. Uh, get 10. Um, and then average it out. And then what's your story for this excerpt? Set the scene, curtain opens, reveal the character, who is that? Who's there? Ooh, someone's on stage, at the beginning of the music you're playing. Something has happened or is going to happen. Oh, dun, dun, dun. The drama. <clears throat> and then the most important question about giving your excerpt life. How does your character feel about the story and the event? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, how does the emotion resolve all these questions? You want a better excerpt? Ask better questions. Answer better questions, too. And the score in your book, the score to the piece, you have it right there at, at easy access. And then your part to the piece. Can you work on that? That's the part you work on. And then this is the one for the next piece. Score. And the excerpt. And go along for each of those. Sound good, and it's such good peace of mind to have it all in one place to hold all the rep. I mean, I watch people run to the their case and have all these different papers and you know, or an iPad as well. Make a PDF version of this book as well, so you can send it to your listeners when you're playing for them online. It's a different experience when people are watching. You know, they're watching your part. Um, <clears throat> and have a, there's a way of making a table of contents where you can click, your listener can click on each part of the, of the, your excerpt book. Uh -huh. So that's, and then at the end, I have a diligence sheet that tracks my daily habits, what different things, hydrate, sweat, meditate, six practice, 25 minute practice sessions. And each day I get my check marks. And if I don't get what I want, uh, I put a star there and that means double your efforts for next time jeff <laughs> get it done tomorrow this is the the uh, an older magic line performance method point form list it will be a better one i can share so that's some more i have some chat stuff going on now i can't oh there's pace um talk about how being married to a great opera singer has affected your music making well i just keep wanting to quit you know because she's really good um yeah it's a lot about story her name is nina yoshida nelson and she's singing all over the place not while she's singing i'm in different locations in north america and england and stuff um and it 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 really makes the work i have to do kind of cute compared to what an opera singer um, has to do just because of all the she's she's got five new roles that she's doing coming up on Christmas and they usually go for four weeks and rehearse all day and night every day for three and a half weeks and then um, take a day off they get the schedule the night before each day so they don't even know they don't even know what they're doing the next day they're just in opera training camp um, doing everything by memory staging um, and all that. I mean, it's cool to be in a pageant and be able to wear makeup and all that stuff, but, um, and then they, they perform everything, you know, going all, we don't, I don't have to really, I, some of the things in Canadian brass, I, I have a little bit of choreography, but, <laughs> but then the reverence of the music and just the way she has to work on singing in check in different languages while letting those, she just did her, her first Wagner. She did a uh, Rheingold and it was different. It was it was her first German, actually, and it was a different language to sing than the Romantic languages, French and Italian. Um, the different roles, do you choose roles to play in the different repertoire I play? Yes, and that's a part of the that story-making sheet that I'll send you, um, is to find the drama and find lyrics. I wrote, I used to write lyrics as well. I wrote lyrics for the Tchaikovsky V, second movement, Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, second movement starts with a horn. It starts with strings, the most amazing eight bars ever. And then the horn. And I wrote lyrics to that. And it was something like, I think, um, if you did leave me, 
and I'd be happy because I really didn't like you anyway. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> like just these internal ways of having your own fun, maybe, and inside jokes or whatever it is that has you be yourself. Michael Jordan, basketball player, talks a lot about just playing like in his backyard, um, getting in the play. We play music, we don't work music, all those concepts. And the roles, they're also one of the greatest things about that is it helps me get over myself. Now it's not me doing this, it's my character. And we get to dive into that, and maybe end up letting go of concerns about myself for that moment of performance you know keep the questions coming pace please but yeah the opera singer life is <clears throat> they, they studied the history a lot more too i think of the piece and different versions um and they, they also have more freedom singers don't have to worry about what's what, what we call rhythm just kidding um but it's a nice thing to give them grief about um my wife also she got her bachelor's degree on violin at Boston University and then was singing at the same time. And then, so she's also the singer that has rhythm. And um, uh, yeah, so she, and when she's singing, she also fingers, I don't know which way, so she fingers on her arm sometimes. She does a lot of new music as well, which is, I can't even understand how she does that. Um, but yeah, it's all about story and getting all that technical work done. And then we transcend the technique and portray a story. I think we get into a lot of regurgitation and target practice and not missing in the instrumental world. Um, so it's that's why this build, build, do all that work that we do, but most people are still building and you know figuring things out for this whole process here. And I have a graphic, I can't find it, I was looking for it, where the normal way of training is you're training and then you freak out about what your first versions are around here somewhere and a little bit more story then you forgot about technique, all this stuff. But here you're front loading the technical work and getting into story. And then now you and you have your first freak out about what you do on your first version, the reality check at the beginning of your second second third, right here is where that freak out is, not here when I <clears throat> have a week left. One other thing I'd like to convey um, is that a week before your big event, you will freak out and you will think that you shouldn't do it. You're not ready and uh, you're a horrible person, of course, as well, because you play out, you miss notes. Um, but that's normal. And it's because when you signed up to train for this audition, you had three months and you were gonna become the greatest musician ever <laughs> at the end of these three months. Now the three months have passed. You have a couple of days left or a week before, usually it's a week before it's the big freak out. And it's, it's because you're not the greatest in the world yet. You haven't become as good as you thought you would at the beginning. But the reality is you still improve tons and it's not up to you. All you have to do is execute all your work. And Because I wouldn't have done any of the auditions if it was up to me. I didn't deserve any of this stuff. Who, who am I to go audition for Montreal Symphony, Winnipeg Symphony, Canadian Brass, all that. It's just... But let the world tell you if you're there or not. Your job is to go through commitment questions at the beginning and now make it about the music and technique. Greatest role and why? Um, I mean, we did a concert after 9-11 happened. Um, and at the end, Canadian Brass, uh, we played Barber's Adagio and it starts with horn and it's a very dramatic thing as well. There's a spotlight on the horn and the other four people stand and look across the stage at the hornist. The horn plays the melody. The next time the chord happens, the second person turns, third person, you know, by the climax, everyone were facing out and I'm pointing the other way across the horn. Um, and then and then it turns back and then the lights go out and we ask them at the beginning to uh, not applaud and that we will have the lights go down and we will leave the stage in darkness in tribute to the events and the state of the world and and I was channeling um, air like uh, uh, the planet like kind of just thinking of of washing things away and um, connecting everyone around the world together I mean and all these things and i think that was a that that was the probably the most powerful performance i'd ever experienced and walking off stage in dead silence to 2200 people in the hall um so it was that 
I don't, you know, it, this is the other thing too with storytelling is that it doesn't have to be a movie or a, an opera. It can be a color, it can be a texture, it can be a smell and a flavor, whatever works for you. Um, yeah, the most fun role was probably Paganini. I do a Paganini Caprice 24 with Canadian Brass. Um, and that's just different characters. I, uh, um, it's the psychotic, the schizophrenic pirate auditioning for the psychotic circus is what I'm like, just, I can do this and I can do this. Ha, ha, ha. Like all these different things, different ways of being virtuosic and then romantic and then like just Looney Tunes emotionally. Each, each we did, uh, it's, um, Caprice number 24, a bunch of different variations in different ways. So it's just, it's really, someone asked me in a radio interview yesterday, um, how do you go between characters so quickly with Canadian Brass playing all these different genres? And I was like, hmm, that's a good question. Like I, it's not even been a conscious battle or a conscious thought because I think we're so present in the opportunity right now. It's this piece. We speak between the the pieces as well so we get to talk about context of each piece and welcome the audience into what they're about to experience next um while we let the the cells return to our lips for a little bit and but we get into the context of each next piece it's, it's just so much about opportunity seizing than mistake avoiding um i may i wrote another i came up with a little saying as well i put on facebook a long time ago but it was um success not only comes to those who want it the most, it comes to those who want it the most often. So if you can make your environment be success based, you know, and just little reminders. And when you see, I made the desktop of my computer, um, the Montreal Symphony logo of, of, and it's, you know, that can either be a freak out scary thing or an inspiration. That's up to us along the way. Um, yeah, and how much healthy, tough love we can give ourselves, and how creative we can be with what's in front of us, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Pace, if you have any of that. Thank you for uh, your, you know, just such a massive part of who I've got to be and what I've got to do. Thank you, thank you. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, we're playing with National Arts Center. Canadian Brass is playing with them, I think in December, I think we're the, they're, you're the last concert for us in late December. Yay. After a month of one nighters, this is crazy. Everybody like we do this Christmas concert. We take the first flight every day in case the flight's canceled or in case it goes through Detroit or Chicago or all the delays are. Um, so we get up at four 30, go to the airport, get to the hall, have an hour at the hotel, maybe go for a sound check, eat, perform back to the hotel up at four like it's it's just it's the worst thing ever and it's the greatest thing ever um you want to get to do this it's so and i'm 51 i've left the group twice wants to get married and wants to have kids uh this is my third, third time back and i just can't i can't avoid it it's uh it's pretty awesome <clears throat> so you want to do that it really makes the the work it's probably a lot of work a lot of times to get into the practice room but once i'm in there i set my timer 25 minutes and now okay where what's my work and get in there um talk a lot about diligent practice as well diligence comes from the latin root to care deeply so what are you doing in the practice room what do you care about do we care about playing for 25 minutes or way more specific growth ideas and doing 25 minutes at a time and when i'm in the practice room now i'm less about seeing growth and more about doing my best and not always sounding my best um, but doing my best i'm doing the things as well as i can and if i do that i end up building habits maybe weeks later when habits are a result I'm not looking to build habits in the moment i'm doing things as well as i can that's it and marking my part and, and you know the tuner um calibrating yourselves to do it that way habitually eventually that's taking a lot of the stress and critique about how am i doing in the practice room off of my work because i'm executing in there and really um yeah i don't know i gotta look, think about other ways of saying that but doing my best at whatever i'm doing getting efficient losing anything extra that's the definition of efficiency 
is uh, you know we're becoming as efficient as possible i had an alexander technique lesson yesterday that's what he's talking about you know at our level at all of your level as well you're at a point now where you're it's much more about losing things that are in your way than gaining more things to do and more things to be good at it's it's finding less is more less is more as i extend my posture a little bit um yeah it's just so much awesome stuff to figure out and we get to figure ourselves out through music it's the greatest way to spend our lives i think <clears throat> you know um there's a question here too um i didn't get to all the questions i'm really sorry the distracted by silly things focusing on things instead of the music um yes what i i talk about my sister did my flute playing sister she's in uh, near london england and the chair of the british flute society you see um she played two recitals uh, she said the second recital was better and i asked her you know why and she said well, i think i was i was more focused the second time and i said i don't think you can be more focused just kind of as the little brother poking her but also i think it's kind of true that we can we're always 100 percent focused what are we focused on um and she may have been more focused on the music than the, the bee in the window or the person in the audience that maybe could hire or whatever you know all these different choices so i believe <clears throat> in the, along that responsibility line of thinking that i don't get distracted things don't distract me i choose to think about that and there's a loud sound it says yeah a door closing someone coughing that can take my attention for a second but now it's up to me to continue giving it my attention or just back go back to you know that they're gonna have to come and take the horn off my face to stop me <laughs> you know um and be so involved you know there's people who go bump but i'm when you go when you make a mistake and you stop right away on the mistake that's a very uncommitted performance in my mind you know if you can if we can stop that soon that means we weren't really thinking that we're gonna get it it's like oh don't miss you know and you, so there's different ways of seeing that happening in the in the practice room as well um but yeah I, nothing distracts me i choose to focus on these things and, uh, and what's more important i hope that helps how do i deal with comparing myself to others I have a tendency to do that try to suppress it as hard as you can yeah that's another really all these questions are really great um that if we make it relative i like saying that if you if you think it's between you and someone else you're lowering your sat your standards right if you just think that you know being the best of all us lowly humans will get the greatest version out of you it's not true michael jordan isn't playing with other people he's just putting the ball in the hole from wherever it is and, and making that happen right and being the greatest version he is the williams sisters beethoven mozart they're, they're being the greatest pillars they can be and i think that's what surprised me when i ended up winning auditions was i looked around and and they end up continue still being picked for it you know along the way so the comparing is is a mistake there's a standard you keep that standard keep it unemotional um but keep going for that standard um but it's unreachable that's the perfect version so we can compare ourselves to that and each of our perfect is different for each of our individuals keep evolving that listening to more and more music and learning from more and more people and then when it's performance time every time whether it's daily or just that last moment it's about going for that standard and and then instead of suppressing it embrace the opportunity other opportunities instead yeah i'm not a big fan of suppressing things or stopping or fighting or blocking it's more embracing something else learn love well let go like find out something else to love well rather than the comparisons and then if you're being compared to others you'll find out after the performance uh, and then however that shakes out inspires my practice or not sorry i'm speeding up because i have a, a meeting in two minutes you know, I have to let you guys go too. tensing up and panicking during quick passages slow practice is it really bent and ramp it up slow or not ramp it up but um speed up slowly into each thing i think and then keep less is less is more and doing it um whoa, that our body over here doesn't have to become the body and when i go to the dentist i try and relax my hands and relax my jaw muscles while holding it open like there's all these tension that we might not need yeah so those are some ways of doing all that thank you very much everyone thanks for coming i hope this was helpful um and it's my pleasure to be here and be to be invited back what an honor to be back again here today thank you so much i wish you all the best 
I have a quote that I say uh, to inspire you as well. In my dream, the angel shrugged and said, if we fail this time, it will be a failure of imagination. And then she placed the whole world gently in the palm of my hand. You can do this. It's worth it. Go for it. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. This is really wonderful information, and yeah. I'm sure it will be yeah. helpful for other musicians and even for me as a filmmaker. So it's really great. Yeah. So um, again, thank you very much, and uh, hoping to see you soon. Yay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.